Good morning. We're live this Tuesday morning. It is July 5th, and I hope everybody had fun on their long holiday weekend. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are live this morning with Julie Dorr Sinkfield. She is going to talk to us about the transition to college for neurodiverse students, and she's going to explain to us what that means. But before we get there, we are going, I'm going to remind you that if you're watching live on Tuesday, July 5th, then you can dialogue with Julie. Um, just put comments in the comment section and she'll address them live. If you're watching at any other time, she will not be on. It will be a replay. And thank you for watching the replay. Uh, but you can put questions or comments in the comment section and dialogue with other people who are watching replays because a lot of you do that. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Thanks so much for having us here. We're really excited. I've learned a lot talking to Julie in our pre-gaming up to this conversation. So mm -hmm. I know you guys are going to learn a lot from her today, too, and hopefully get some helpful resources if your family um, needs this type of conversation and needs to be looking for the information that she's going to tell us about. Mm -hmm. Why don't we begin with you telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do? So I'm a career educator, mm -hmm. everything from pre-K through college. I've done, I'm a retired school principal, school founder, work, and I've worked with students in, you know, who need special education services for a long, long, long time. I happened to be in two schools earlier in my career that specialized in that. So, um, and then my son <clears throat> is neurodiverse, as is my 16-year-old daughter and myself. So um, we come by this kind of naturally. But <laughs> um, they're my muses. You know, I went into education. I wanted to create a world of education. That was the kind of place I would send my children to. So I always opened schools and worked in schools where I sent my own children. I felt mm -hmm. that was important. Um, <clears throat> and then I have been around the world and back and was trying to kind of figure out what I was going to do. And then my son told me that he needed, he was going to go back to college. Um, and what many people don't realize is that when students with learning differences, special needs go off to college, they lose a lot of the structure of home and high school. And when that falls apart, all of those parts of their lives kind of fall apart too. So that students who are highly capable, who did great in high school, who worked really hard, who are really, really smart, get to college and then all of a sudden can't make it. Mm -hmm. And it's terrible. And, no, and they don't know why. Nobody explains to them why, because we think of learning differences as only affecting academics. But the reality is, is that if you can't read or spell in school because you have dyslexia, you can't do that at home either. You can't do that outside of the classroom. You can't do it when you go to the DMV, you know? So unless you have all of the services and supports that you need, the college transition becomes very, very, very difficult for those students, much more difficult than it needs to be. But that's where we are right now. Okay, thank you. So let's back up just a little bit. Let's define neurodiverse. Okay, so neurodiverse is the, is the idea that the things that we used to call learning disabilities aren't learning disabilities, they're learning differences because you can be highly capable, highly intelligent, highly qualified and still have a learning difference or have a neurodivergent brain. So what happens is that you see the world a little differently. You see it through a dyslexic lens or you see it through the eyes of someone who doesn't have significant executive functioning and doesn't have significant habits. You see the world, you are able to see things that other people don't see in terms of um, outcomes, in terms of figuring out problems, in terms of things like that. But, we, but most people never get to that point where they have that, that, that expertise that is credentialed because people are not providing services for students to continue their education with the support they need through college and graduate school. Okay. So people who are neurodiverse fall under people who have ASD, autism spectrum disorder, people with ADHD, ADD, um, which is an old, an old um, <clears throat> um, delineator, people who have dysgraphia, people who can't write, you know, people who have dyscalculia. So mm -hmm. it's similar to dyslexia, but it has to do with numbers and math. Okay. Um, so People think it's just about the math. People think it's just about the reading, but it's not because your whole world is seen through that same lens. Yeah. So that all the places where math interacts with our lives, you're still gonna have that issue. 
unless you are taught and supported how to get past those things and function out in the rest of the world. Okay, so let's say um, families are watching and they have students who fall within this neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, and they're receiving services and accommodations, and those mm -hmm. are different. You're going to tell us yes. about that. Yes, they are. In high school. Mm -hmm. But now they're, they're, they're getting ready. Maybe they're a junior in high school. Maybe they're a senior in high school and getting ready for that um, transition to college. What is it that they need to be looking for and doing? Well, first, we need a little bit more of awareness in high school for parents about what this looks like and what, what disappears when they move. So the first things are um, the structure of home, that there's always someone there, there's always food in the refrigerator, mm -hmm. that the trash is taken out, someone reminds somebody to take the trash out, you know, someone reminds somebody that they have a thing tomorrow, there's a big calendar on the wall, you know, there, there's noise in the morning waking people up so people get up. All of those things are structures that, we, that are just part of life mm -hmm. in a house with a family or in a home with a family. When you leave, all of those things fall off. The way that we rear children is the idea that we think that if we keep telling them this stuff till they're 18, at 18, they're going to have it. And even students who aren't neurodiverse <laughs> don't always have it. But, you know, you, you shove all this stuff in and you hope that it works and you send them out and then they may or may not make it out there. And there's nobody out there helping them. There's no, there's no one to turn to for resources. There's no one to turn to to get support in an academic setting after high school. There's no one to turn to to get support on a day-to-day -day basis in, in a home life after that. Um, there's no one teaching executive functioning school skills in K through 12 education. Nobody is teaching that to kids. Mm -hmm. So either they have to intuit and work it out on their own because they are neurotypical mm -hmm. or they lose, they miss a lot. They miss a lot of cues. They miss a lot of, of things that they should know by intuition. Um, one of the things that is becoming very clear in, in the world of, of neurodivergence is that people who are neurodiverse respond to explicit instruction, very explicit and purposeful instruction, where you say, okay, look, you've got to learn how to do X, Y, and Z, okay? <clears throat> We're gonna work on those things with you. We're gonna make sure that we're working on them so that you get those life skills to be able to manage college and go on with your life. But mm -hmm. it doesn't happen. The services aren't there. So the compliment that you would expect after you graduate to continue just isn't there. Mm -hmm. So many people say that they provide services to students who are neurodiverse. Mm -hmm. And when you ask them what services they provide, they say, oh, we have tutors and we will get them extra time on a test. And we will have them, you know, they'll get an extension, automatic extension on their papers. They will get, there are things that they can get, things that they can access, okay? But what happens outside of school? What happens outside of the academic part? You have students who have social issues with roommates, with hallmates, who don't know how the club system works at college, who don't know, <clears throat> that they're supposed to go and meet with professors on their own before they have a problem, introduce themselves, because these are the people who will give you mentorships and things like that. Those are things that kids who are neurotypical will pick up from other students and pick up from other places. Students who are neurodivergent often will not pick up those clues and respond better to explicit instructions. So we do a whole thing with our people where we orient them to college in a way that college doesn't, because it's not there. We know it's not there. Now, services are things like time management. Services are things that help you get organized, keep a calendar. Services are, are supports that help you work out um, time management skills, getting a project together, working on your schedule. That's a lot for someone to have to work on manually. Neurotypical people tend to think it's automatic. You just know how to do this. But it's not, it's just an easier thing to figure out if you were neurotypical. Mm -hmm. So when college, when, and there are, there are colleges that, that are just for students who are neurodivergent. Landmark is one of them. There's a few others around the country, all right? But there's only a handful of them. Mm -hmm. And they're very expensive and often provide little to no financial aid. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a consideration. And um, what, before we go on, what makes those colleges different? 
So they're, they are structured more like high schools are. Mm -hmm. So that they, they have, they all, and all of the students have the same issues. So you can mandate things for an entire campus that will support students like regular study halls, regular study hours, you know, mm -hmm. that each class will have a study hall assigned to it so that students can go straight there, get the support they need from the TA or the teacher and go on from there. Most colleges don't have study halls. Yeah. You know, they have office hours, but this makes it more about getting the interaction, getting the support, working on the relationship all at one in a college that is built for that. Mm -hmm. Other colleges are really, some colleges are really good at providing accommodations. Um, many say they're services, but they're not. They're really just accommodations. So things like a, like an like an interpreter or a sign language interpreter or a note taker, those are accommodations. They're not services, and people don't realize that. So colleges will tell you we have lots of kids with ADHD here. We have a bunch of kids with ASD here. We have a bunch of yes, we support them. They have tutors, and then what? <laughs> so. Parents and, college, and high school students need to be real clear that they are asking them specific questions. Do you have services? Do you have accommodations? What is a list of each? To find out if your kid is going to get the support on campus that your kid needs. Because mm -hmm. your kid, who you can't get up in the morning, mm -hmm. is not going to get up any easier at school. So they need special support and advising in terms of creating not only just creating a schedule, but also creating a life to support a working schedule. So I remember when I went to college, I, you know, we had, I'd be in school 7.30 in the morning at high school, went to college, signed up for a 9 a.m. class. Mm -hmm. I never made it to that class because 9 a.m. hits different when nobody's waking you up. <laughs> so <laughs> nobody's putting your cereal on the table for you. You know, 9 a.m. hits different. And so <clears throat> there are things that, people who are neurodiverse need to know, need to understand, need to ask about, very seriously ask about, um, in terms of if the school is gonna support their lifestyle, if the school is gonna support their academics, if the school is gonna support them socially. And if they don't have those, you should look someplace else because you know what your kid needs. Your kid is not gonna change overnight. The kid you have as a junior is gonna be the kid you have as a freshman. Yeah. Even if they decide to get their lives together, do all their work all of a sudden, or even if they decide to go all state and something at junior, you know, whatever it is, it's still the same kid. And we can't take their talents and measure them and say, well, you're this talented. That means you can do this much. When we know that there are differences in these people in terms of how their brains function. So they can't always rise to the challenge the same way someone who's neurotypical can. And the world isn't made for them. It's not. You know, um, when we look at things like what constitutes professionalism, you know, you look someone in the face, you have a strong handshake, you know, you are social over the water cooler or the proverbial water cooler, whatever that is. Um, some neurodiverse people are not like that. They don't, they don't take those clues. They don't understand how to engage with people like that. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with a mismatch of all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the ability to work or the ability to do the job or your credentials or anything else. But it's about how we per how neurotypicals perceive the world. Okay. Um, and I like I like what you said about the world isn't made for them. It's it's made for neurotypicals. And, 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 and it's not that there's a problem with people who aren't neurotypical. It's that we haven't paid enough attention. Yes. Know that we are blocking. It's 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 like if you don't if your if your building is not accessible, physically right. accessible. It right. is not a problem of the person who cannot access the building. It's the problem. It's the building's there. problem. Yes, it is. I you have. have um, okay. So, do students need to have a medical diagnosis or some kind of documentation to receive yes. services? Yes, you need some kind of diagnosis, mm -hmm. and then the way it works in public school is, you know, you you do poorly enough until someone notices. And then the teacher, the parent, the school, they all fill out forms. You go through a whole you know, diagnostic process. And at the end, they decide whether or not you are dyslexic enough or attention deficit enough or mm -hmm. autistic enough to get services in school. Mm -hmm. And so, so just because you're diagnosed doesn't mean you automatically get services. But 
Just because your kid didn't get services in high school doesn't mean they don't need them when they are in under a different situation. So something needs to replace what happens at home for them. Mm -hmm. Something needs to put them in a situation to be compelled to know when to go do laundry, to know when to, you know, to, to manage their time in terms of the things they have to get done so that they're not late for this. They're not forgetting these things. They're not, you know, it's a lot more juggling of mm -hmm. things in college than it is in high school, juggling on your own that are, that are done for you. Your schedule is done for you in high school. You know, from 7.30 in the morning to four o'clock where you gotta be all day. You just get shuffled along. In college, that doesn't happen. And your classes can be 7 a.m. They can be 10 o'clock at night. They can be anything in the middle, depending on what you're studying. Mm -hmm. So to have to get people to move from functioning within an eight-hour schedule to a 24-hour schedule or an 18-hour schedule or something like that, because college becomes all of your world. It's all it becomes the main focus of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then having to put in jobs and having to put in travel time. That's a big, that's a place where a lot of neurodivergent kids fall down. Travel time. Because if they got to be there at nine, they're going to be ready at nine. But nine is ready across campus <laughs> 20 minutes, right? So yeah. that's something that sometimes you have to explicitly teach someone. It seems simple, but people who are neurodivergent don't always intuit things the same way people who are neurotypical do. We have a question, but I want to... Um remind parents of something that you said that um, make sure that some people are at home and families are wonderful supporting their own students. Make sure you have a recent up-to-date diagnosis and documentation mm -hmm. for your student because you never know when they're going to need outside services. And if they're moving from a very structured home and school environment, mm -hmm. to an unstructured college environment, they're definitely going to yeah. need them. So make sure that you yeah. have that. If you don't have it, work on it. Yeah. Um, Lori says, what services would you suggest colleges offer or families to look for other than tutoring? What specifically would help knowing a college is likely not going to wake kids up every morning or that providing study halls would be optional and people might not attend? Yeah, I only know athletes at those big schools to get study right, halls. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, there, there are lots of, what can a college do? Well, a college can, college can do lots of things. A, they can assign advisors directly to those students who spend more time with them and who help them work out some of those identified life issues that you've got to work out, figuring out the schedule, figuring out a bedtime. You know, most people, most high school students go to bed when they're, when they're, when people say go to bed, nobody's volunteering to go to bed early. You know, <laughs> they're going to bed when they, when they, when they're told to go to bed. Mm -hmm. If you're in college and people stop telling you to go to bed, you need new clues. So, or providing an orientation for students who are neurodiverse, training your advisors in the things to work, look out for them. Because sometimes by the time midterms come out, it's too late. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you need someone who is working with them on a regular basis in the school who can make sure that they have a relationship with someone so that if they have to pivot, they have someone to talk to about. It. Mm -hmm. They're not floundering. They're not talking to other students. They need to have and adults, I mean, college students are adults, but they need to have a professional adult in their corner who is working with them the most directly, who can help them work through some of these things. Mm -hmm. Colleges can provide information to students who are neurodiverse in terms of, you know, the bet, how do you maximize college? How do you maximize college? You have all these resources. How do you know what to use? How do you know where to go first? How do you know when to go? Mm -hmm. Making those things more explicit for all students would be better, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then things like, you know, technology makes services and accommodations much better, you know, much better because you have programs that will record lectures for you. You have, you know, the ability to do things online that you couldn't do. You can do voice to text. You can do all of these other things online that you used to need people for. So you no longer really need note takers in quite the same way because you can record the lectures. So the dependent on a competent note taker you know, isn't quite as, as significant anymore. And so the technology, if you have a student who's good with the technology, that's great. But otherwise, people need to be taught how to do these things. People need to be taught how to go to bed. Mm -hmm. They don't always know when to go to bed. <laughs> I don't always know when to go to bed. But at least I know that if I got to be up at six, I know I got to be in bed by 10. I, I know that now. Yeah. But at 18, I didn't. So I'm going to get to 
where they can look for some of these things if a college doesn't have them? Because I know that there are people out there wondering about that. But first, mm -hmm. what skills do our student, students need, especially our neurodiverse students need be, when, when we drop them off at college? Um, what they should we be working on now? <laughs> money, managing their money. Okay. For the first time, really, they're going to be managing their money on their own. Because mm -hmm. in the house, we're always commenting on what they're spending their money on. What are you doing yes. this? Why spend it? Why'd you buy that? Blah. And those kind of those kind of function as informal checks to mm -hmm. behavior. You get to college, and what happens? You've got whatever your allowance is, and it's gone in four days. You mm -hmm. know, you thought you bought forty pounds of root vegetables, and in ten days they're they're all dead. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what I'm saying is that. We don't teach our kids executive functioning skills. We don't teach them how to plan for that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want to teach kids to fend for themselves. Mm -hmm. I think cooking is a great thing to do with, with students because you got to shop, spend money. You've got to make decisions about sizes, about portions, that kind of stuff. And so using a tell, show, do model with your kids on everything that you do. You talk to them, what's the purpose of this, okay? The purpose of this is X, Y, and Z. We're gonna, gonna learn how to do these three things, blah, 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 and you're gonna learn how to make this thing that's gonna be easy thing to you to make in college. Mm -hmm. Those are things that you can work through with them multiple times. What happens if you wanna cook something and you go to the grocery store and it's not there? How do you pivot? Those are things that you take, you should take your kids with you to do that stuff on purpose. You know, um, um, their closets. What do your kids' closets look like? <laughs> so whatever you do, you know, you're going to have a smaller closet than you have. You may have a roommate, you know, you may have, um, you know, you're going to have to learn how to clean, put stuff away, you know. So everything from labeling a closet at home, showing them how to label a closet, showing them how to organize a closet on their own, because again, you assume they know what's happening and they don't, but they're living within a structure where probably someone else is doing their laundry and putting it away from them, or at least sorting and folding it. Yeah. And then it gets shoved in a drawer. And yeah. then the way it gets used is how it gets used. It's not necessarily used in the form that we would want, want it used in. And I, I'm going to interrupt you for just a moment. And I want to emphasize the difference between the neurotypical child and the neurodiverse student is that the neurotypical child when they run out of clothes, we'll figure out that everybody else is going to this laundry room and coming back with clean clothes and we'll probably Google or, you know, hey, Siri, yes. yeah. how do I do laundry? The neurodiverse student is not going to take that leap on their own. Yes. Right. And, that, and that's basically what it is, is mm -hmm. that um, because their brains function differently, mm -hmm. some of the clues that we use, oh, I've only got two pair of underwear yet left. Mm -hmm. Okay may not be the clue to go to the laundry room. It may not be till you have zero yes. that they go. Um, it may not be until, you know, something disastrous happens that occurs to them to go. Mm -hmm. um, it may not be, a lot of people don't know how to use a washer and dryer at all because they're done, it's done at home. Mm -hmm. So knowing how to do laundry, otherwise all their stuff is gonna be pink when they finally go, you know what I mean? <laughs> These are realities. Everybody at least once, so that's yes. okay. <laughs> but these are realities of what it, what what it's like to have to break these things down. So, you know, you can't assume. So, I'll I'll give you an example. My son was about eleven or twelve. Um, he always took showers. He was not the kind of kid who wouldn't take a shower. Mm -hmm. But every time he kind of came out of the shower, a different part of his body was still dirty. What is going, why? Every, sometimes it's your head, sometimes it's your right elbow, you know, armpit, sometimes it's your butt, sometimes your feet are still, you know, whatever it is, there was always a different part of him that was still dirty. I'm like, why are you still dirty? He's like, I don't know. And I realized at some point that I didn't think he knew how to take a shower. Even though I bathed him as a child, you start at the top, you work your way down, right? And then I kept doing that till he started cleaning himself. And as far as I knew, he had intuited that you start at the top and work yourself down. Mm -hmm. he never did, you know? And so I had to put a list in the shower. So it was a number, it was a word, it was a picture because I never knew which thing was going to trigger his recognition, but I knew he could keep it in order with the numbers, the pictures and the words. 
And after I did that, I laminated it, put it on three sides, and now he's he's been clean ever since. He's 27 now. He's not missed a spot since. <laughs> but I had to do that. I had to determine that that's what the problem was and then do that, yeah. you know? Um, well, I like visual visual reminders are important in skill. If you have a kid who won't, who forgets to take their medicine every day, put a picture of it on the door. Mm-hmm. Leave the medicine by the door so that every day that is the that's the clue that is the trigger, and they take it and then they walk out. Yeah. You know, yeah, it would be great if you could leave it in their bedroom, but they're not going to take it. They're mm-hmm. not going to remember half the time to take it. But if you keep it in a central place near the door with a picture, then those things will help. So I also like, you know, people have people have moved to digital everything, digital calendars. I like visual reminders. Visual reminders are very important for someone who is neurodiverse. Because unless every single day is exactly the same and you do the exact same things every day, you need to have the reminders. So that when things aren't 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 on schedule or things change, because they inevitably will the ability to pivot and still keep up with what you need to do needs to be something that's a constant reminder around. Okay. So the skills you mentioned, managing money, cooking, time management, laundry and chores, we're talking about life skills beyond academics. Yes. Uh, We've been doing this now for 25 minutes. So I'm sure everybody's got that. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But these things are important because if you don't get these things, you don't get to the academics. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it and and the students who fall within the category that the categories we're discussing are fully capable of achieving on the academic scale. Yes. They are. It's it's other stuff that's blocking them. So, so an example of that is people always want to talk about due dates. Due dates mm-hmm. are great, but when's the start date for the work? Yes. So yes. okay, I see that it's due on Thursday, but when am when when am I what, do I wait till Thursday to work on it? Yeah. How do I break out the time? Mm-hmm. And if you are a neurotypical person, most of the time you work that out. You know how, how long it takes you to do stuff. Well, well you kind of work it out. You make it happen. You stay up all night. Mm-hmm. You throw it in. Da, 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 da. If you are neurotypical, you may not start on time. Yes. I mean, neurodiverse, you may not start on time yes. because you don't know how long it takes. So an advisor, like an advisor just for students like that mm-hmm. would work on things like that with them. We okay. put together a proactive training with them, how to set up your schedule, setting up a living schedule. So that means from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, it includes your meals, includes your sports, includes your clubs, includes your work, includes your, your um, school, includes, includes your study time, includes your social time on the weekends, it includes, you know, everything, put everything in there. Mm-hmm. You know, when I work with clients, I tell them, you get your nails done every two weeks. They're like, yeah, I'm like, why isn't it on your calendar? If it's a priority, put it there. Mm-hmm. And that's and we don't we don't teach students that. We don't teach anybody that. Yeah. That if it's something that's important, put it in there. Even if it's trivial to the rest of the world, put it in there. Yeah. So you know you've planned for all the things that are gonna make your life complete and happy. Yes. Now, you mentioned colleges assigning advisors who specifically help the neurodiverse students in these ways. Mm-hmm. I want to remind parents that is something you should be looking for, asking about. Don't be afraid to mention that yes. your student needs it if it's not listed, because you may change the program there. Mm-hmm. You may start something. So don't be afraid if there's a school in it and you think, oh, I'm not going to, I'm going to steer my student away from it. Talk to someone at the school because they may be thinking about it in the background and just haven't no. Um, publicized it yet or so a lot of times they're doing things but it's not on the website so right. always always contact let's talk about your know, students not going to a landmark school or one of those sister schools um the school has not responded positively when you ask them about services but your kid is going to college because your kid wants to go and the family wants this to happen so now what do we do do the parents have to continue what they're doing at home or because they've got other kids and jobs and now the student right. may be out of state well two things i'm going to say one is if they don't respond don't send your kid there yes because they're not going to respond to anything mm-hmm. for the next however many years they're there or half mm-hmm. a semester however it works out you mm-hmm. know don't send your kid there if they don't have answers to any of those questions. Even if their answer is insufficient and you can talk to them about more, that's great. But if they don't respond, they're not interested and they don't have anything and they don't know how to respond to you mm-hmm. about that. Um, so that's the first thing. 
Um, but the second thing that can be done is, well, I, 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 start, I started a company. <laughs> <laughs> so when I said my son, went to board, you're right. So my son went to, went to high school, struggled through high school, took a gap year, went off to the college of his choice, blah, 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 blah. And very, I just flamed out royally. And I was, you know, we were like, all right, we're not paying anymore for this. We're, we're done. You go figure out what you're going to do. So he, my son became a PE teacher. Um, he works, um, his father's an athletic director, coach. My son wanted to do that too. Um, he's been working through like contracting companies to be, to be PE teachers in schools, particularly in charter schools and private schools. And when COVID happened, his job disappeared. And that was always my thing with him. Look, you're getting older, you know? I don't care what you want to be, but you got to be something and you got to pick it soon because you're going to need health insurance. You're going to need a credential of some kind, blah, blah, blah. He wants to be this teacher. Okay, great. He said, I got to go back to school. I said, well, I can't help you right now. I said, I got two kids in high school and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life and mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. So let's find somebody who can help you with this whole process. And I went looking and couldn't find anybody who could help him the way that he needed. Most life coaches, most executive function coaches, most um, most uh, college you know counselors, things like that, um, they're not thinking about that kind of stuff. They're they're not, and they're not thinking, and they're not catering to a neurodiverse clientele. They're catering to a clientele who, between the parents and the kids, every week will work on the essay, get it in, turn it on, da 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 da, all this kind of stuff. Not with someone who is neurodivergent and doesn't really understand how to get started. Mm -hmm. So what people like that need, tend to need, is full-time, day-to-day micro-coaching. And that's what my company does. So I went looking for someone, couldn't find somebody. I did a bunch of research myself um, on cognitive behavioral th therapy and on, um, and on um, elementary education in particular with regard to the science of learning. And I trained somebody in that. I got them some courses and I, and I talked to them about how I thought he would work best. That these were the things that I thought he needed to do. You needed to set out goals. You needed to turn those goals into actionable items. And then you needed to take those actionable items and break them down into tasks. Mm -hmm. and it needs a reminder on a regular basis until he can do these things himself. Mm -hmm. And so in the United States, we have this thing about adequate education an adequate education is till you're 16 years old. That's all that the United States requires is that you stay in school till you're 16. We have never updated what con constitutes an adequate education in this country, you know? And so nobody's getting this stuff. And within 18 months, my son got two new jobs. Um, well, three now, because he has another one. He got two new jobs. He moved, he got a girlfriend, moved to go live with her, and now has a new job that he's starting next week. That would have never happened. And he's in school. That would have never happened without his life tutor. Mm -hmm. And so when it started working, I got another kid and was like, and it was a, it was a friend of mine's kid who was kind of floundering in college. He was, hit, he was hanging in there, but he wasn't going anywhere very fast. Mm -hmm. And 18 months later, he's graduating from college. You know, he has a girlfriend now. He's got his life together, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's through this daily micro coaching that we do five, 10 minutes per day, you know, in interaction between the life tutor and the person um, and the client. And then every weekend, a pivot session. You look, you, you, you get excited about the stuff you did great. You look at the stuff that you weren't able to accomplish or get as far on. And then the life tutor helps you learn how to pivot with those things and reschedule them or mm -hmm. move things around to the till the till the client gets to the point where they can they can um what do you call it um predict how to make those adjustments themselves because the whole point is for them to be able to do all of this themselves eventually eventually yes eventually you know but we will follow someone all the way through college into graduate school or adulthood we've helped people we've helped clients um i had a client who's 31 32 years old has kids, has a pro has her own company, has another job, blah blah blah. Has a has attention deficit disorder. We went through some things. I got her. I got her a really great coach, a life tutor is what we call them. Um, and her and and in the eight weeks she was working, she create she finished a huge project and then got a new job. And she's like, I would never have finished the project to get the new job. 
if I didn't have somebody every single day talking to me about what I need to get done, what I need to get done, how I need to get it done, what I need to stay on top of, you know? And so that's the kind of, we just want, we, honestly, we want our people to be happy. I want my son to have a happy and good life, you know? And I want other people who are like him, who are equally capable, equally intelligent, equally charming and pleasant and fun and wonderful to be around and have them be, you know, credentialed and gainfully employed so that they can have a comfortable, successful life. And so, you know, the frustration factor is really what we take away from a lot of people. You know, some people can look at it as insurance for college, you know, that we're helping their, helping their kid matriculate because our entire focus is on college, a successful matriculation and college completion. Mm -hmm. That's what we do, period. I can't guarantee you eight semesters, but I can certainly guarantee you much shorter than if he, your, your kid was flying by the seat of their pants and wasting money, doing all kinds of things, that kind of stuff. So that's where we fit in, right in that gap. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we also do work with EAP organizations so that uh, we can work with professionals too, who are at work and who need some extra support on time management, on, you know, pivoting, on planning, on all those types of things that you need, those life skills. So if you what get into college- What does for? Huh? What does EAP stand for? Oh, sorry, Employee Assistance Programs. Okay. So through health care, through health insurance, there are there are usually accompanying employee assistance programs. And okay. a lot of them provide things like life coaching, like wellness, like acupuncture, like you know, other other things that are that are adjacent to medical care. Okay. And so um, we are working on getting we are working on becoming providers with a couple of companies so that we can also work with adults that way. So, and that makes us available where we were, we've been invited to provide services in Washington DC and Georgia for the state rehabilitative service agency that works with college students who are neurodiverse. Um, because we are virtual, we go everywhere. So any college, any time, any place. Um, and it's only five to 10 minutes a day. So yes. any student, college student can find that. And mm -hmm. it's going to be prearranged, so it's going to be on their schedule. Yes. And then the weekend pivot session. And the yes. goal is for them to do this enough because you have this tell, show, do model. Mm -hmm. And if they do enough, eventually they'll be able to do those things on their own. Right. So there, there, there is an end game. This is not right. forever and ever and ever in their life. They may come back to it when they get into a different environment. And, yes, and exactly. Sharpen skills or something. But this isn't. Um, we want our clients to go off and be successful on their own, period. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want a client who's dependent on me forever, ever, 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 ever. Mm -hmm. That means they're not learning anything. Yeah. That means they're not getting any better with anything. Mm -hmm. Right now, we don't have any, any, any lower tier clients. You know, mm -hmm. we, we have an idea about lower tier clients who we could put on like a weekly schedule or something like that as they transition off you know, later on. Um, but we just don't have any clients like that right now who, who need that ongoing support. But the idea is to get them to independence. Yes. You know, and know that we're always here. So if, you know, your spouse get, get you know, my spouse got transferred to Brazil. I had to pack up a house, three kids, move us all, blah, 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 blah. I could have used a life tutor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we are... At the end of our time together, um, if there's one thing that, and only one thing a family gets out of this conversation, what should it be? Be realistic about your kid. Okay. We all want great things for our kids, but make sure that they're in a good environment for them. Make sure that you are looking not just into the reputation of the school, but the reputation of the school in terms of how they graduate kids, the frequency of graduation, you know, the, the graduation rate. Mm -hmm. um, you want to know what kind of services and accommodations they can get at the university. And if you don't, if they don't have any and you're, and you insist on sending them there or they insist on going, you got to get help for them because yeah. it's really the only way to make it through, make that transition work well. Yes. So. Thank you, Julie. This was Thank great. You. I hope people learned as much as I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there are plenty of parents and adults out there going, I want a life coach or tutor and then <laughs> about it for the kids once I figure out my stuff. <laughs> thank you everybody for joining us, whether this you're is great. live or on the replay. Thank you, Julie.
And please remember to, we're going to do this again on Thursday. Thursday is the Inside Scoop with Sue when she speaks with someone who has an expertise or um, experience in something that is going to interest you as an adult who is raising a tween or teen. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Right. So we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.